Welcome. Well, welcome to Advanced uh, Chemical Analysis. This is Chem 311. And, and my name is Dr. Samuel Mugo. You can call me uh, Sam uh, and I will be your instructor for this uh, course this semester. You know, I hope all of us, you know, had a good um, holiday break and we are rested and ready to embark on, on this new semester. So in, in this lecture, we just largely go through some of the course expectations and that, that way we're gonna get uh, everyone started and, and comfortable to know what is expected of them in, in this particular course. Now, I always like to start, you know, with these slides, you know, on what are the students' expectations, you know, for this course. So the question to you is, why are you here? And how do you intend to have this course maybe fast track, you know, your path to the different career choices on, on where you are going? And, and I hope, you know, most of you guys know where you are going. And so uh, if you don't, of course, I hope this course is also going to help you towards uh, that direction, you know, helping you know where you, you, your passion lies. And so take a moment, really, you know, to, to think on that question, you know, why do you really want to take this course? And what do, you get, what do you intend, you know, to actually, you know, uh, get out of it? So in our session tomorrow, you know, that's January the 7th, that's a meet and greet session. You know, like each one of us really, you know, to share, you, you know, wh why they are taking this course and what um, the, their career aspirations are. And the reason I often do this is to hopefully, you, you know, personalize the learning and things like the assignments and so on can be personalized, you know, towards each student's individual path, you know, to where they want to go. So again, January the 7th, planned to share on, you know, the, um, your, 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 your major and why you're taking this course, what you hope to get out of this course, and possibly your, your trajectory, you know, as far as, you know, your career is concerned. And my goal really is to help students, you know, towards the different career paths, you know, they hope to embark on. And so I emphasize the need, you know, for every student really, you know, to learn with a goal in mind. You know, you, you guys spend a lot of money to pay for these courses. And so as such, it should be an investment. It should be able to help you. Uh, fast track or maybe even accelerate, you know, your pace to the career path of choice. And so I hope as your mentor and of course the peers as well, we're going to create uh, a, a learning uh, environment, you know, that helps each one of us, you know, sort of accelerate or find, you know, the path to the careers, you know, um, of, of their choice. And as such, you know, you're going to find chemical analysis or advanced chemical analysis is a highly interdisciplinary, you know, type of course, which intersects in so many different types of industries, you know, be it food industry, pharmaceutical industry, clinical diagnostics, many different, you know, career paths. And as such, you know, we should be able sort of to link, you know, whatever career path you are interested in, you know, to analytical chemistry. And so, and so my goal really is to help that interlink and show you the relationships, you know, between the skills that you're going to learn in chemical analysis and how they can apply to very divergent fields that are represented you know, among the students' community, you know, that are seated here, because I believe most of us intend to go into different directions. And as such, chemical analysis really has got an interlink, you know, to wherever you are going. 
So the learning ambience, I think most of you have attended my courses, particularly those of you who came from, you know, the CAM uh, 211 stream. But nonetheless, I also understand there are students, you know, who joined the course, you know, from the CAM 353 stream. And as such, you may not have encountered, you know, my style of teaching. And so what did you get yourself into, especially for you guys who don't know um, my, my style of teaching? I, I like to emphasize, you know, that my classes have to be a safe, you know, collaborative learning environment. Everyone is valued. Everyone is respected. Everyone's view should be expressed and I encourage you to express it. You know, that's the reason, you know, for collaboration, really, as, as, as a reason for collaboration. And everyone's view, you know, should be expressed. And as such, you know, I hope we're going to have a very engaging, you know, environment between me as your mentor, but also, you know, among, you, you know, the student peers, because we can learn a lot, you know, from each other. And so my teaching philosophy really is, you know, not to give you too much. I believe less is more. The less you're given, probably the more you can think about it. And so I really encourage you, especially in Camp 311, to spend time to think about uh, why you're learning the different concepts, you know, that I'm going to put across, you know, because the course is fairly heavy, actually, in the course content. So I'm going to make effort, you know, to really distill it on it to what you really need to learn, you know, the less is more, so that I don't really get you overwhelmed. But hopefully you get to have a lot of think time, you know, about how these concepts, you know, apply to the different fields of interest, you know, that are fairly diversified, really, among the students. And so I believe, actually, in this psychologist model, that every student, you know, can get an element or an environment, or, or the course can create an environment, you know, where the content is fairly you know, um, stimulating, it's challenging enough, you know, for you to be stimulated. It's, it's not too, um, you know, simple such that you get bored. So, you know, challenging enough for you to be stimulated. Hopefully it connects a lot with what your interests are. And so you get yourself, you know, interested. And so hopefully you get that element, you know, of flow to see the relevance of the content that you are learning and the currency of the content that we are learning. And most of the content too, you know, is fairly personalized. You know, it's not just me feeding you with content. You know, but I hope, you know, especially, you know, in the evaluation, I'm going to show you these, you guys are going to do some research projects, some presentations. And so there's be an element of personal control, you know, to contribute, you know, to the knowledge, you know, that is shared. So as such, you know, is an intersect, you know, of mentor, myself, you know, contributing to the knowledge but also students, you know, contributing their experiences and their presentations, you know, to the pool of knowledge, you know. And so I hope, you know, um, you know it's going to be an enjoyable, relaxing, yet enjoyable, you know, environment, you know, to which you learn, you know, with all these intersections, you know, of knowledge from different uh, directions. And as such, take time to think, what, what, why... Are we learning whatever we are learning? And how can it apply? And of course, there's divergency of applications. And, and that's a key. There's always divergency of applications, you know, to whatever we learn. It can go in many, many different directions. And I am known to digress. And I, don't, I wouldn't call it digressing. Every time I cover a chapter, hopefully I'm going to show you different approaches, different prongs to which you can apply that concept, you know, for different types of, you, you, you know, applications towards solving societal 
uh, problems. And in fact, you know, th that divergency of application is really what sometimes, you know, people call the art of innovation, you know, taking uh, a concept, you know, that is mundane in a certain environment, but also applying it, you know, to different types of um, areas, you know, that it has not been applied uh, before. You know, a little further on my teaching philosophy, I, I, I believe that academy should be connected to industry. M most of us, most of you, are going to end up, you know, looking for a job in the industry. And so I should, I believe, you know, there must be, there should be an intersect between the theory, you know, that we're going to teach you in class and the practice that you're going to learn in the lab, but in an academic environment. And hopefully show you how it connects, you know, to real life, you know, industry, you know, where most of us, you know, are going to go, are going to get hired. And I believe this is what you call translation of knowledge, you, you know, into something that is relevant, you know, to the community. And so I spend sort of quite a bit of time, you know, helping students sort of, you know, connect the relevance, the theory of why, what they are learning and how it applies, you know, to the modern industry and, you know, where hopefully, you know, most of you are going to find uh, employment. So, so, so I believe really students, you know, should be taking these courses again, you know, so that uh, the, 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 the courses and the skill sets learned help them towards getting employment or rather even creating jobs, you know, through innovation in the chemical industry. Now I should mention the following, you know, you guys are um, completing your education in a very disrupted job market. You know, if you look at Alberta economy, and I don't want to be a pessimist, I'm more so an optimist really, you know, if you look at the Alberta economy, you know, since this is a distribution, you, you know, of, um, of the revenue from different types of industries. You're going to see predominantly, you know, our economists still rely on the fossil fuels. And, and all of us know the trajectory, you, you know, that is not very hopeful, you know, to where the fossil fuels are going. You know, I think there's already, you know, an agreement, possibly among the economists and everyone else, that possibly we have reached, you know, the peak of the fossil fuels uh, demand. And going forward, you know, you're certainly going to see a decline, you know, in the demand, you know, of the fossil fuels as, um, you know, the supply, you know, from the green technologies, green energy technologies, you know, take the place. And, and as such, and of course you've seen, you know, the government of Alberta and the government of Canada trying to emphasize, you know, the need to diversify and hopefully try to get substantially away from reliance, you know, on the fossil fuels. But the status quo it is that it remains is that we are still very, very reliant, you know, on the fossil fuels that don't have a very bright future. And, and that really impacts, you know, the, the job market because of that reliance. And so you are graduating, really, you know, when we should be thinking about how, you, you know, we, we should diversify the economy and as such. You know, you guys would be, you know, the players, you know, towards diversifying the economy and hopefully, you know, looking for possibilities and opportunities outside, you know, the fossil fuel industry. And so uh, in, in Chem 311, I try a lot, you know, hopefully to show you some of the different applications, you know, beyond you know, really the fossil fuels, you know, where each one of us you know, can find meaningful uh, passions and employment, you know, beyond the fossil fuels industry. So it's a good idea for us to really think beyond, you know, the fossil fuel industry and think also actually as a global citizen, you know, in terms of where our skill sets, you know, can be used, you know, across the globe. 
as you all know, you know, you're becoming really a global village, you know, can, you, you, you can um, serve a different, um, um, you, you know, you, you, you can use your skill sets, you know, in different, uh, in different geographical, you know, locations. And so to summarize all that, you know, I hope CAM 311 is going to be, you know, a piece of a puzzle together with all these other courses that possibly you guys are taking. And so I hope we develop, you develop some skill sets, you know, that are going to help you towards solving societal problems, you know, that make you relevant, you know, towards, you know, getting um, a, a meaningful path, you know, towards using those skill sets. And so I hope you develop, you know, those critical skills that are so much needed in a very disrupted, you know, job market. And if you look at Canada and the Western countries, there's what people call the innovation gap. The innovation gap. And, and the innovation gap really means, you know, that our trajectory on technology and innovation, particularly in Canada, you know, has gone down in comparison, of course, you know, to the, to, 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 to the, um, you know, to, 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 to other competitors, to the G7 countries, for example. And, and so I believe, you know, some of these courses, you know, like say CAM 311, you know, can help you develop, you know, an innovation mindset you know, where, you know, you move from just knowing, you know, that's the theory, you know, to doing, and we do a lot of that, you know, in the lab, developing all these, you know, practices and skills. And of course, that's what the industry really is looking for. What can you do? Not what you know. It's no longer what you know. It's what can you do with whatever you know. And that's where the application, the critical thinking, you know, element lies. You know, so that you can be, you can be whatever you choose to be in terms of solving societal problems, if at all you know how to apply the critical, you know, skills that you learn, you know, towards being. So hopefully, Chem 311 is going to help you towards that part of not only knowing, but also doing, so that you can be and find your path, you know, into the, the, the career of your, of your passions. So very quickly, you know, I'm going to go through, you know, the critical elements, you know, of the course outline and sort of, you know, what the expectations are. Now, the lectures are designated, you know, for Tuesdays and Thursdays, 12.30 to 1.30. Now, I'm going to be recording all the lectures and making them available, you know, every week. So every week I'm going to post, you know, two recorded lectures. And I'll be available to you as an office hour, you know, during these designated, you know, lecture times. So you're not required, you know, to come during, you know, these office hours. But I encourage you to drop in, you know, and ask questions and so forth, okay? So the mode of delivery in these courses is going to be what they call asynchronous, okay? And that's what I've tried to explain, you know, that I'm going to post the recorded lectures and you guys, you know, can review them at your own given time. If at all you've got any questions, you can drop in during the office hours, which are during the designated lecture hours. I'm going to be available on Blackboard Collaborate. However, I must emphasize, you know, there are some days that you'll be required or all students will be required you know, to attend, you know, the lecture hours. And that is when you are required to present. And I'm going to show you a couple of dates where there will be students' presentations. And so everyone is required to come, you know, to the Blackboard Collaborate on those specific days, okay? So take note of those days and I'm going to flash them, you know, as I go through the course outline, okay? I assume you're here because you got at least a minimum of C minus in CAM 311 or the other stream that you're coming from could be CAM 353. And so I hope tomorrow, you know, that means on January the 7th, as you share sort of, as you introduce yourself 
please comment on which stream you're coming from. Is it CAM 211 or is it CAM uh, 353? Now, the labs are going to be face to face in room 5014. And the first lab is going to be on January the 20th, you know, from 12.30 p.m., you know, to 4 p.m. The lab manual and the schedule is going to be posted for you on Blackboard. It is required, you know, that students complete 70% of the lab component for them to pass the CAMP 311 course. It's also required, just like CAMP 311, those of you who did CAMP 211, you know this, but those who did CAMP 353, good laboratory practices are a critical element in the industry. And they are also a critical element in what we try to teach you in CAMP 311. Now, a critical aspect of good laboratory practices, a GLP as they call them, you know, is how you record and document, you know, um, your, your procedures and results in the lab. And as such, you're going to need a physics, you know, record book or, or lab notebook, which is going to be graded, you know, at, at the end of the semester, you, you know, for your lab. So take note of that. You need a hard-covered physics, you know, notebook, or at least a hard-covered notebook, you, you, you know, uh, for, your, for your labs. Of course, you're also going to need, you know, the lab coat and the other PPEs, you know, such as the safety glasses and so forth. Now, I'm mainly going to use this textbook, you know, called Quantitative Chemical Analysis. Now, you're not required, you know, to buy the textbook. I highly recommend it, but you don't have to buy, okay? So the notes that I'm going to provide are sufficient for you to pass the course. But if you want to, you know, interrogate, you know, the subject matter further, you know, I encourage you, you know, to read uh, the quantitative chemical analysis, okay? Now, it's a fairly expensive textbook, and I, I, I understand if you're not able to buy one. In fact, I've got a couple of copies in my office and you can take some, you know, on a short loan. So if at all you want a copy, you know, take it on a short loan, you know, so long as, of course, you return it to me, you know, at the end of the semester. Now, I also going to often refer to these other textbook. Though the quantitative chemical analysis is going to be the primary textbook, Sometimes I refer, you know, to the principles of instrumental analysis by Skook, and sometimes I'm going to refer some uh, content, you know, from that textbook. Sometimes people call it really, you, you know, the, uh, the, the, the compendium of analytical chemistry. If you do your PhD and so on, master's, graduate school, you're going to find this is a textbook that you're going to use for any analytical chemistry, especially instrumental instrumental analysis okay but of course i don't expect you guys at all you, you know to get one so the, the course is fairly heavy in content as you're gonna realize there are many many instrumental methods out there and so again less is more we're gonna focus on the most critical instrumental methods you know such as uh, analytical separations and of course there's a huge field you know, of analytical separations that I'm going to summarize for you. We're going to talk about uh, different types of um, spectroscopies. Now, in CHEM 211, you guys covered a little bit of the UVV spectroscopy, but in this course, we're going to cover, you know, the other types of spectroscopies, you know, such as the X-ray, the OG, and so forth. We're also going to cover things like, you know, the Raman spectroscopy, you know, the fluorescence spectroscopy that sort of was mentioned, you know, in CHEM 211 and so forth. But one critical aspect that we're really going to focus on is how do you really distinguish between signal and noise, you know, which is a critical aspect, you know, of um, instrumental methods. And so that's going to be our first chapter, you know, distinguishing of signal to noise and the theory behind all that. 
Yes, we're going to talk about the figures of merit. How do you relate signal from the instrument, you know, to the concentration, which is what you are interested in, so calibrations. And those of you who did CAM 211, again, you are very familiar with calibration, so things are going to be fairly straightforward for you as far as calibrations are concerned. But for the sake of those who did 353, you know, I'm going to sort of repeat on calibrations. Again, remember, if you go to the industry, this is the crux of the matter. You know, that's what you spend all your life doing, really, calibrations. Now, we're also going to talk about the figures of merit. And the figures of merit, you know, refer to how do you evaluate, you know, the performance or what are the performance criteria of different analytical methods. And so based on the performance criteria, you can compare different analytical methods so that you choose the most appropriate analytical method, you know, for a certain problem. Now, you're going to see most analytical chemists in the industry, that's what they mainly spend their time on, making decisions on which instrument would be appropriate for a certain problem. And so people use, you know, what they call the figures of merit as indicators or an index of how to make that decision. And so we're going to talk a lot, you know, about the figures of merit. And you guys, especially those of you from CAMP 211, sort of already know about, how, about them, limits of detection, limits of quantification, dynamic range, and so on, which we're going to talk about, you know, in these codes. And finally... You know, we're going to talk about electroanalytical techniques. This is the future, really, of analytical chemistry. You know, they are highly miniaturizable. You can make them into small sensors, you know, like most of us are wearing, possibly Fitbits and, and, and things like, uh, you know, um, smart watches, you know, um, iPhone watches and all that. And, and, and actually, you know, those are the basis, those types of, devices you know i've got electroanalytical uh you know sensors that can help them monitor you know things like blood pressure you know things like glucose in sweat you know and so forth and of course you know that's the future really sensors is the future you know of analytical chemistry because they are very very small you can distribute them you know to do analysis of the point source which is ideal you know, compared to the classical way of doing analysis where you bring the sample into the lab, where the lab consists of very expensive instrumentation. So you're going to see the future is going towards small devices. And electroanalytical techniques are very uh, adept or, or they are very, they lend very well, you know, for miniaturization, you, you know, so that unskilled of the general public really can do uh, analysis, you, you, you know, in the field, okay? So the key thing is, in all this content, I, I like you guys to really connect, and I'll show you, and, and we talk a lot about this, you know, connecting the theory, you, you know, to the applications, and of course, being able to choose the appropriate method, you know, for the right type of, um, the appropriate method, you know, to analyze a problem. So it's going to be quite an important, you know, learning outcome. So the list of experiments, you know, to be covered, um, you, you know, because of the pandemic, I've sort of shortened the number of experiments. So this semester, we're only going to do, um, you know, really five different experiments. Four of them in the lab, two, three, four, five, will be in the lab, in person. Now, the sixth experiment is going to be virtual lab. You know, you'll do that at home. And, of course, the dry lab is going to be the very first assignment that I'm going to give you so that you know how to do data manipulation, especially calibrations, which are very, very important, and which you got skills that you're going to really use in all these different other labs. So that's the very first um, sort of dry lab which you're going to do, again, you're going to do that at home because it's just data manipulation. And I'm going to talk to you about that, you know, in due course. You know, the other component, you know, of the lab is that, you know, you're going to do a research project. 
and the research project is gonna comprise up to three lab sections. So you're gonna do all these labs, but also a research project that's gonna account, you know, for three lab sections. And you're gonna see that, you know, in the schedule, you know, that I provide you. And I'm gonna talk to you in, in the next couple of slides you know, about the research project in general, you know, because this one account, you know, for 20%, you know, of your final marks are very, very significant. And the whole goal of doing this is to get you acquainted, you know, to doing, for critical thinking, you know, so that, you know, the experimental procedures are not just given to you, you know, but you develop your own experimental procedure, you, you know, you go through the hypothesis, you know, you're taught um, or you learn how to do the writing and so forth, scientific writing and presentation. That's going to be the component, you know, of the research project. So maybe quickly to summarize, you, you know, um, so some of the learning outcomes, this course is going to be very light on calculations. It's going to be mainly on theoretical concepts, very few calculations. In fact, if I ask you to do a calculation, it's only going to be to demonstrate a concept. So the focus in the course is going to be mainly concepts, all right, and very few calculations. So the lectures, you know, will discuss information, you know, about different um, components of the instruments. Most students sometimes think of these instruments, they are Raman or a UV as a black box. As an analytical chemist, we can't afford to think about it that way. And so we have to go right inside the instrument, you know, and look at all the components and the theory behind all those components and also determine, you know, which components, you know, determine the output, you know, which is the signal. And how can you tweak or troubleshoot each component, you know, so that it gives you the best signal, okay? You know, so that, that's the reason for doing, you know, this um, particular course, you know, in terms of what can I change within the instrument, you know, so that I can get the best signal. And I should mention that some of the jobs available for analytical chemists is actually to make instruments. And, and partly that's what I did before, you know, I became a professor. I was involved in development of instrumentation. And it's a huge area, you, you know, of employment, you know, where, you, you, you know, an analytical chemists try to design, you know, different components, say a detector, you know, so that you can get increased, you know, um, sensitivity or increased, uh, increased signal. So you're going to be looking at the theory behind each and every component in the different types of instrumentation, spectroscopies, um, you, you, you know, mass spectroscopy, you know, X-ray spectroscopy, you know, um, HPLC and so forth, and how it determines, you know, the results that you get. In the labs, you're going to explore the concepts, you know, related to the instrumentations in, with regard to how they are applied, you, you know, for, towards solving uh, analytical problems. So hopefully you're going to see the connection between the theory, you know, and the practice when you go to the lab. Now, there will be assignments, you know, which involve um, reading general articles. And this one relates also to the research project and presenting it in class. Also, the research project, you know, when you develop or design the experiments, you know, and actually execute them in the lab and then present it, you know, to the class or disseminate it in form of a presentation as well as a thesis you know, which again, I'm going to give you more details on that. And again, the goal for the research project is to apply the knowledge learned, you know, so that you can solve a societal problem. Now, in this course, it's expected, you know, that you, you are progressing towards being an independent, an independent chemist. And for that reason, you know, that's why, for example, you know, in the research project, you know, we're going to get you to actually 
you know, develop, you know, or design the experiments and not just given, you know, a, a procedure, but you develop your own procedure. And that hopefully helps you towards independence, you know, as a chemist, because of course, when you go to the industry, there'll be a responsibility, really, to design, you know, the project. There'll be a responsibility, you know, to report the data. There'll be a responsibility, you know, to do all these things, you know. And so hopefully the research projects help you towards that path of being an independent critical thinking, you know, chemist. Now you're also going to find, unlike Chem 211 and maybe 353, some of the information will be missing in the labs, in the regular labs. And this one is intentional. So that you get to think, you know, about how do you solve a problem. I'll give you an example. Now, instead of being given, say, one molar of sulfuric acid, sulfuric acid, maybe what I'm going to give you um, is 38% sulfuric acid. And it will be a responsibility, you know, to determine how do you dilute, you know, 38% sulfuric acid you know, to one molar sulfuric acid which you are asked to use in the lab. You know, so, so, so it wouldn't be completely spoon feeding, you know, like in the Chem 211. Again, for the purpose of, you know, getting you to be a lot more independent, you know, towards the path you're going of finishing and going to the industry where you're required to be the one to provide guidance, you know, on these things. And again, as I've mentioned, you know, we're going to talk a lot about uh, instruments and its components and how that impacts the figures of merit and how you are required, you know, to choose a certain uh, method, you know, of another and what you need to do to do that is to, um, you know, be aware of the figures of merit and how to apply them. So in the next in the next um, in, in the next chapter or sort of lecture, you know, I'm going to talk to you again a little more, you know, about uh, the research projects because I'm confident most of you have got a lot of questions about, you know, the research project, you know, the 20% research project. How is that going to look like? And hopefully I'm going to answer your questions, you know, about that in the next lecture.